done the thing first is like the most liberating feeling. But today I'm going first and I'm actually really nervous. So please let me know if I'm speaking too fast. And I hope you guys enjoy all the topics that we discussed today and take something home and provide some meaning to your life. So without further ado, let's get started. So my topic is being a part of the conversation. Before I even go into talking about what being a part of the conversation means, I want to discuss what it means to not be a part of the conversation. Because at my time at UT, I felt very alone, a lot of times because of my Mr. identity. So I'm going to paint a picture in your head because I love pictures, and I love drawing, and I love photography. And so here we have a really pretty but kind of pixelated table of food. And so imagine that you were invited to a dinner party. And this dinner party is the party of the year. You're so thrilled that you were invited to this party. And you read the invitation, and you put your map, um, you put your address in Google Maps, and you don't even do DST time and come on time for once. And when you arrive there 15 minutes early in your freshly ironed outfit, you see that all the tables are full, the food is already being served, everything is already happening all without you. How do you feel? The whole event is happening, and you're not even a part of it. You're in a room full of people, but you feel totally alone. That's how it feels to not be a part of the conversation. And that has really fundamentally made and shaped my UT experience thus far. So here I have Ajanamas. During my very first week at UT, I had a class in ROP, or form room CLA, and I remember I was running late and I had to pray, and I had no idea what to do. So what did I do? I found a random corner on the first floor. Do you guys ever see that corner? I can take you after. And what happened was, I went to that corner and I put down my jacket and I prayed to Mons. And I, in that moment, I didn't really think about who was around me, what was happening. I just knew I had to pray to Mons, time was going over, and I had to go to sociology. So, I prayed. And as soon as I finished praying, a girl came up to me and told me, and I was really shocked. She said, you should tell people next time before you're going to do that. She told me I had to warn her before I prayed. And in that moment, I thought, I could do what? Did I, like, accidentally sleep talk? What was happening? When I was praying, did I do some kind of like ninja move? Like, I didn't even do karate in that But I came in and I apologized profusely. I said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. And as my day went on, I thought about it, because I'm the type of person who's very introspective. If like in the morning I see an article at 12 a.m. like the next day, I will think about the article and be like, oh, that's what that meant. So I thought about this and I was like, what? Why did I apologize so much for practicing my religion? Why did I feel the need to tell someone I'm sorry that my religion is a burden on you? Instead, I should have educated her that day and told her, you know what, this is Namaz, I pray five times a day, it's important for my spiritual upbringing, and it's important for me to remain peaceful and healthy, and I didn't do that. And so that brings me to my adventure of reflection spaces. So through my time at UT, I really tried to create and expand the reflection spaces we already have on campus. So we already have one in the PCL, and we have one in the Union, this is this building probably visited it earlier. And what I did was I went and I tried to work with the organizations I was involved in to try to make reflection spaces more accessible on campus. And working with organizations, I finally got a meeting with the liberal arts team. And at that moment, I felt so excited. You guys, this is me getting into UT times too. I was like, I got a meeting with the dean of the College of Liberal Arts. This is so cool. I didn't meet a dean. They're going to know my name. But, but that's besides the point. I got there. I had a portfolio. I had a color-coded binder. I brought my best like dress pants. I was ready to tell her what or him, what I wanted him to do for me. And I thought, because I was maybe a liberal arts dean, I was going to be speaking to someone who understood religions, cultures, values, beliefs, because that's what liberal arts is. And when I got there, I told him, you need reflection spaces. And you know what he replied? He said, OK, that sounds cool, but how many times a day do you even pray? And that shocked me, because as someone who is obtaining the highest level of education in the College of Liberal Arts, you should understand and you should know that Muslim people pray five times a day, not, you should, that shouldn't be a question. So I got a slide and I was like, okay, I'm educating him. This is like humanitarian work I'm doing, right? Not really. But then he asked me another question and it shocked me even more. He said, are there even a lot of Muslim students on campus? So, this is what I got from our social media for Texas MSA. These are all numbers, and I know we're all probably all on the same thing. I follow Instagram, and I'm part of the Facebook group. But that's not the point. The point is to show you that we have a lot of Muslim students on this campus. Past and present, we've had a lot of Muslim people walk through this campus. They've all gone to PCL, their finals, they can cry. They've all gone to Jester, JCL, to eat, to 
the terrible cold pizza. We've all done it, we've all experienced it. And the fact is, there are a lot of Muslim people on this campus. And if he did not know that there were a lot of Muslim people on this campus, that doesn't mean he's ignorant, it means that we haven't been putting ourselves in spaces to start conversations about the Muslim identity. And so, that's what I'm talking about. We have so many people, we have power in numbers. There are so many students on this campus that I should not have been the first person, the College of Liberal Arts Dean, who was a I should have been the first Muslim person that he ever met, but that, that was the case. I educated him, but that made me wonder afterwards how many people who are in high positions don't ever interact with Muslim people. How many people are making decisions on a daily basis without the consent or the interaction with Muslim people and thinking of us whenever they make laws and policies and different types of things that are affecting us on a daily basis. That's what happened at the dining halls where we don't have food accessibility because there was no Muslim part of the conversation. That's what's happening with reflection spaces as well. And so now I want to talk about how we can be a part of the conversation. How can we change this narrative and instead of just being there existing on campus, I hope that we can be a part of the conversation so we can really elicit change. So how can we do it? I have three things that I actually want to hit on. The first one is don't be apologetic about practicing your religion. You should not say sorry that you couldn't eat your co-workers brownies during Ramadan because you were fasting. I found myself this summer when I was working in the Capitol always apologizing to my coworker that she would make these desserts and these brownies. I could never eat them. And I remember the very first day I told her that, she was like, oh, you're getting a blood test done, that's why you're fasting. And I was like, no, 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 I'm fasting because of my religion. And so she told me, I kid you not, so you're Egyptian? <laughs> but the fact is, a government bureaucrat, someone working in the government who's advocating for different policies, thinks fasting is an Egyptian practice? Not Ramadan. I educated her that day, but the fact is she had been living her life for 50 plus years not knowing what Ramadan is. When you can find a CNN article any time Ramadan begins. So don't be apologetic about your religion. Instead, inform people in a diplomatic way how they can understand why we do things, why some of our spiritual practices are so important to us. Instead of profusely apologizing because we had a praying corner and that affected someone. The second thing that I recommend you do is extend your neck. I know that we love staying in our pods of the Muslim community, and I love it too. I love all the Muslim friends and people I've met at this university because they've made me a better Muslim. But if we want to start having conversations, we have to extend our network and get involved in organizations that don't necessarily have the same community we feel here. Because if we're not extending our network, then we're not being a part of these meaningful conversations that are changing our lives and changing the way we live. And so, the final thing that I'm going to say is that I really want that you guys are including Islam wherever you go. I'm not telling everyone today to go change the region of government, go work for the government, go become a bureaucrat, because that's not the answer. Because if you go work for the government, then who's going to help those engineers who are working at different institutions find reflection spaces in their own offices? Who's going to help those physicians create different types of Islamic awareness events? Wherever career you're doing, whatever you're passionate about, make sure that you have Islam awareness embedded into that. So those fields continue to flourish, and Muslims who go after them in the future are able to also thrive and practice their religion fearlessly. Because the fact is, we can have all of us become doctors and all of us become lawyers, but there are still so many fields that don't have Muslim representation in them. And the fact is, we're not going out there and advocating and talking about our religion openly. And it's so important to And I'm not saying, just go up to your random coworker and be like, hey, feel like Muslim. Like, no, like, make it organic. But during Ramadan, educate people. During Eid, bring a platter of whatever matai you want to or anything, but educate people in a really nice way so they can understand us and they can begin to really fulfill and understand, like, they can include us in the conversation. And so I hope at the next dinner party when we're there, I hope we find a table. I hope that we get a seat. But more than that, I hope that we start having, we start throwing the parties so we can create these conversations ourselves and we can change the negative misconceptions and change the narrative that has already been written by so many other people who don't understand Islam. Whenever we look at those CNN articles that say 70% of Muslims have blah blah blah. Change that and we have the power to because if you're sitting here, if you're capable to attend this incredible university and you have the opportunity to be spend your Friday night here, I'm sure you have a lot of time to just tell your classmate who is fighting you in your econ class that Islam is bad. I've had one of those girls. So I educated her and that's what I asked for you to do too. So in the future, other Muslims who walk these at this university and walk this universe don't feel like this religion is a burden on them because it's not. It's a beautiful religion that has allowed us to grow and flourish and thrive in so many different ways. 
So please be a part of the conversation, but more than that, start initiating those conversations. Thank you.